Greetings, fellow Empyreans. I am Astrothy, and this is the Eve Universe Show's continued coverage of the CSM 17, this time with Alaventi. How's it going, my friend? It's going very well. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Um, so you're one of those names during this whole interview process that, at fr- like, it was one of those, like, splinters in my brain where it's like, man, I feel like I knew this dude. And then I look through your your history and I see that, you know, we were in the gal mill at the same time. You and I have, uh, you know, I've obviously been aware of you uh, in a few different ways, but I don't think we've ever gotten a chance to sit down and chat. Is that true? That is true. This is my first time actually speaking to you. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. And this is also coincidentally your first time running for CSM. Is that correct? Yes, it is. All right. So uh, before we talk about why you're running for the CSM, let's first get to know who you are. Uh, In your thing here, it says that you joined in 2010 and then you were fighting in syndicate. Was that during the the syndicate fight club days? Yeah. So syndicate back then was really interesting because there was just a bunch of small alliances that lived there. Right. And due to how CCP did the balance of ships back then, like T1 battlecruisers were, were like the go-to ship for roaming. So every day it was just, okay, let's form up a T1 battlecruiser fleet and go roaming. And so there'd be like 10 or 12 T1 battlecruiser groups out throughout the day. And so like other groups from outside syndicate would come in to get in on the action. It was really, really cool. Yeah, I think that it's pretty fair to say that Syndicate Fight Club was one of the best... I guess, semi-organized uh, no man's land, I guess, or, you know, whatever you want to call it, free-for-all brawl zone uh, in the history of EVE that I have seen, right? Like, the, people have tried these kinds of things before, but basically, it was a period of time in which people just decided that, like, syndicate is for fighting. Anybody who wants to even try to live there must appreciate the fact that that's what we're here to do. Syndicate's an NPC space, though, right? It is. So it's not like somebody could old sob or anything like that, but it was a, it was like everybody just decided to descend upon Syndicate to uh, to brawl it up. Do you know what caused that to happen? I think it was just a natural evolution, and there really wasn't anywhere better to be because it was before the last Faction Warfare rebalance. So Faction Warfare right. before that was hot garbage. So if you wanted good small game content, you just went to Syndicate. Right, and then you, uh, but then Faction Warfare changes did happen. Inferno happened, and uh, Faction Warfare got f- fixed. Uh, and then you said that you were there from 2011 to 2014, which would make it just prior to Citadel expansion. That's the era that a lot of people refer to as like the golden age of Faction Warfare. Yes, I, I mean, I very much enjoyed my time with Faction Warfare. Um, I think that's that's sort of the point at which Faction Warfare was sort of at its peak and started declining. Like, we could start to see the issues with the system. That's fair. That's actually something that people haven't really talked about, which is that there was even a Faction Warfare rebalance that was talked about prior to Citadels, right? I remember back in the Tweet Fleet Slack days, there was a discussion with uh, CCP. I can't remember exactly which CCP or it was, but they were going to be taking on Faction Warfare, and there was a whole discussion that was started about what it would take. And I remember even then, the number one thing that we knew that we were going to like work on or what they were going to try to do was adding suspect flags to people coming into, into Faction Warfare. So like, things weren't perfect before Citadels, but Citadels uh, and Structures definitely... Um, uh, undermined some of the mechanics, and then subsequent years of neglect basically made a lot of the key players that actually cared about the the context, the war zone control of faction warfare, to uh, you know leave, which kind of left us in a pretty dire state up until about eh, sometime last year. It started to pick up a little bit, but it hasn't been the same. So, what have you been up to since then? Um, so I. Went and joined Hard Knocks for a little while, lived out of a pause, and how wonderful of an experience that was. Um, I was in NC Dot for a little while when we were fighting the Russians for the control of the drone lands. I've uh, been in Flying Dangerous again. Um, I'm a fairly nomadic person. Um, I went back to Wormholes with Mouthtropic Calvary. Were you, were you um, just... part of uh, the whole like um, School of Hard Knocks, uh, the, um, the Keepstar situation? 
No, I, I think it was before Keep Stars or in any Citadels were in the game. Okay. Sorry, because I know that like that around that same time, since it's all kind of related, Hard Knocks put up the the first Keep Star in a wormhole. Okay, so uh, what 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 are you doing now then? Um, so I'm in Flying Dangerous. Um, we own some sob space out in Tenerifis. Um, so the Imperium has been invading, um, and so they've been they've taken up pretty much all the space up to Flying Dangerous as sob. So we're expecting a lot of good fights coming shortly. Okay. Um. So preparing for for the the swarm to hit. Yes. All right. Well. So why are you running for the CSM? What was the moment? What was the thing that made it so that you were like, I've been playing this game for 12 years, but now I want to give up a whole year to talk to CCP about things. So I've always just sort of thought about running for the CSM, but it was never something that I felt like I was like the absolute right person to do it. Um, I think myself and I'm sure many, many, many other candidates um, decided to run because of FanFest. Um, I was very let down by the keynote, um, but I did go back and watch the Living Universe's brief. And so I am much more positive about the future of EVE. Um, and if you haven't seen that, please go back and watch the video on that. Um, it was what the keynote should have been. Um, so there's CCP is going to do a lot of changes. And one of the things that they said was that they're going to introduce new things to faction warfare when they do their rebalance. But they're right. hoping that some of those mechanics can affect space beyond. Like they might add something new to Sov or new to Wormhole Space or new to NPC Nullsec. And as someone who's lived in all of those areas, I feel like I am the expert that should be on the CSM to give a firsthand perspective of how those changes will affect all of those different spaces. Right. So your point is, is that you, you have faction warfare experience, so you can help with that like main context, but because you also have experience with those other key areas of space, you might be able to help bridge that gap of not only what, uh, how to frame the context correctly, but also uh, ramifications. Because I think that, one of the dangers of doing this that is kind of unspoken is if you have faction warfare be the context in which a null thing happens, well, now you actually run the double risk of people not caring, right? Because if, if faction warfare don't engage with it, then what happens? Does it not come into existence? And if nullsec doesn't care about it, then why did we do any of this? Is that pretty much the problem that you're looking at? Yeah, so so I'm I'm just concerned that they're gonna like add something, um, and it's gonna change something or it's gonna destroy a playstyle. Like CCP already looked at wormhole space and said, "Hey, you guys are the unfortunate casualty of this change," and I'm worried that they're gonna continue to do that um, with the Which good change? ideas. Um, I believe it was the recent adjustment to medium structures, oh, structures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and the reinforcement timers. I don't. I don't know if I agree that they were an unfortunate, uh, like, I, wormholes get to be collateral damage all the time, but they explicitly made wormholers a shorter time than everywhere else. It doesn't feel like it was an accident this time. Right. And, and, and that goes back to the balance between, you know, high second, low second, null second warfare, or and wormholes. Um, you know, there is a, a higher risk to wormhole space and that generally comes in less or fewer or shorter timers. Right. Yeah. Um, I do like the wormhole uh, situation is really what nailed it to me that the medium structure change was just basically to make medium structures closer to passes. Cause the original timer was a day and a half, which is the maximum amount of time that you can have for Strant. Right. Like it just seemed too much of a coincidence in, in all the different ways that medium structures match or were like, all of the changes that were made made them more like passes, is what I'm trying to say. Right. And and I think the challenge with that is that if you want to go beyond a medium structure, your costs go up exponentially. And Absolutely. a lot of small groups can't really afford a Fortizar with its core. Right. So let's actually jump down that one real quick, because um, this is something I've talked to a couple people about, and I'm really interested about as I'm sort of starting to unravel this, talking to different people from different areas of space. 
And you having multiple perspectives might be an interesting one to weigh in on this. So the issue, in my opinion, with medium structures is that there's multiple issues involved, right? So there's, there's at least three different things that are happening when it comes to the medium structures. There is uh, the fact that medium structures, if they're going to be as defensible as posses, the problem is, is that they are three times the cost. So while you don't all have to live out of the same locker anymore, uh, that is a huge difference. Plus, with the core, it guarantees a drop for the aggressors, making it more attractive to attack. So uh, if they're going to be passes, they cost too much. Second, the shield's lack of damage cap means that it can be stripped away very, very easily. Um, passes have, can be either death starred which makes them very, very dangerous to attack, or dick starred, which makes them completely inconvenient to attack. So while they don't have damage timers, it's not like people are knocking over posses willy-nilly because there's a certain amount of commitment. The fear is, is that with it being so easy to strip off the shield timer, um, there's no reason to not troll them or at least look to see if there's an advantageous timer because it's not like you have to figure out, you know, there's not an X factor. You know exactly when the next timer is going to be. You know whether or not you want to be there. And that's the end of that story, right? So that's that's the other thing. Uh, and then, of course, the third being just the additional logistical exposure of it, right? Like, you know, they're bigger. They're able to be found easier. They um, they take longer to, uh, to, to anchor and unanchor. So, but the real question is, is that, like, what oh sorry the third the uh, fourth thing i guess is that there's only two timers now right like so with only two timers then if you slip once then it's gone and so a lot of people in wormhole space are like well if i'm gone for 3 days then everything's gone right so uh, of those different problems you know my initial reaction was just the price one right it's very simple just take out uh, take out cores problem solved let people sell the cores that they have problem solved you know, that makes the structures far more affordable. And now if, if, if medium structures are going to be disposable, they're going to be disposable. However, the thing I'm starting to hear more and more from different areas of space, high sec, uh, a little bit from low sec and from wormhole space, is that the real problem is the shield timers. That it's so easy to strip off the shields that it's causing too many, you know, the, the barrier to attacking someone the threshold is so low now that it becomes something that's not only inevitable, but sooner rather than later. What do you think is the core problem with the medium structure changes? So, like, the, the challenge with it is that, especially in wormhole space, the medium structure changes aren't in a vacuum. Um, with wormholes, you have to look at the mechanics around evictions. And today, you know, the evicting group can decide when, where, how, how many people they're going to bring, what ships they're going to bring. They essentially set the table for the eviction and then they kick it off. So I think what a lot of people are realizing is that the timers were just an artificial barrier that prevent. So let's so think about it this way. The difficulty of killing a citadel requires a certain amount of effort. And if you lower that effort, it's easier. So they need to bring fewer people. They need to invest less to make it happen. Um, the theory is that if the groups invest less in making it happen because it's easier, then it will be easier to fight them off because they're not going to have to bring you know 16 logi or you know 32 other ships to you know perform an eviction um i think we kind of need to wait it out on wormholes because what what tends to happen is that there's there's a change there's a huge rush to knock it out and like interact with the new mechanic i'm curious to see how things level out in like three to six months and take a look at the data when people get bored with just doing endless evictions of medium structures. Um, I'm totally cool with advocating to CCP like, okay, we tried something, but it's a two-way door. We can go right back through the door we came through and undo that change. That's an easy thing to do if we're not happy with the state that things are in. But I think we need to sit on this one and get a little bit more data 
before we jump to hey it was success or hey it was a failure I find this so interesting because I was really expecting these interviews to be like a lot about this topic because, you know, it was kind of the hot bucket button issue as we went into all this. But I am hearing a lot of that kind of nuanced, you know, let's let's wait and see thing, which is wild in a world of like people complaining about CCP not iterating on design fast enough most of the time. You know, I'm the one that has to point out that PVP often like PVE is easy to balance for or do quick rapid iteration for because you can put out a change, see how people do it, see whether or not it's hitting your targets and make another change. PVP though is a relationship between players and the meta takes a while to evolve. So, you know, in a lot of, in a lot of ways, like even if there's a glaring issue, sometimes often you're, you should wait to see if a counter rises to, uh, to fix that. In this case, Sure, it's the new fancy thing right now, but just like um, abandoned structures, chances are within a few weeks or months, it's no longer going to be like the thing to do to knock over medium structures. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with that. Let's talk more about faction warfare then. That's the reason why you ran, more or less, right? So, so it's a big, it's a big proponent. I love that faction warfare can be an introduction for a new player into PVP. It's where a lot of groups can form. It's where a lot of groups can make money, um, and hopefully, with the LP tax that CCP is adding, can actually like build an alliance and have funding to continue their growth. I gotta say, I'm so nervous about that because everybody's like, everybody takes the LP tax as like an announced thing, but my issue is is that in the presentation. It was presented as CCP Rotati, like, quote unquote, announced it by saying, since you can tax LP, blah, blah, blah. I can't remember what the conclusion was, but like he stated the taxing of LP as if it was like the premise. You know, it was it was already the thing that gets done, the example. And so like a lot of people took that as a as a as an announcement. But I, I just I don't know. I'm, I'm worried about that. But um, it is true that like this faction warfare rebalance is probably going to be so big that looking at the way it is now to evaluate what needs to be happening for what it's going to be almost seems premature, right? Like LP might not even be the primary source of income after this, you know, when this change happens, for example, right? And one of the other things about this is, is that with that I feel like a lot of people have missed is that with the allegiance system and what they've said about faction warfare, this feels like it's not even faction warfare. It's just the empires are now going to have agency and that we are going to be able to work for them. And that if that means mining and resource wars, if that means fighting on the front lines, if that means running missions for them, if that means, you know what I mean? Like, it's all going to just be working for the factions. So the very notion of faction warfare is not only going to be upgraded, but it's the tendrils will be expanded outwards. Now, back in the Inferno rebalance, I remember when we were talking about this, there was a strong push by people not in faction warfare, in particular null blocks, that faction warfare should remain very much contained. I, uh, the biggest example of which was... Um, the, we were asking for Sino jammers on level five systems, so that way we could theoretically jam, uh, jam the systems, and then null blocks would have to coordinate with us if they want to be able to go through systems that we control. Obviously, that was not very liked. People on the null side got really mad about it, and ultimately the uh, idea was pulled back on. But I think that that's a good idea of like where we were at at the time that null that faction other places didn't want to be impacted by faction warfare meanwhile faction warfare is always asked to have impact why don't we have, why doesn't our war have impact in high sec for example on um, taxes and stuff how do you feel how far should uh, should faction warfare extend out of the war zone so um I am super, super, super curious about how CCP is going to handle their new allegiance system. Um, I'll be curious if it completely replaces standings. Like, let's say you can swear allegiance to, say, like, you know, Amar and Syndicate and, um, and then, I don't know, maybe the Garistas. Um, and then it just derives the standings for, it derives your standings based upon um, 
the derived standings of who you've sworn allegiance to. And that just straight up replaces standings. That determines what you can and can't do within the universe. I don't... Um, or if they go somewhere else with it. Um, From what I heard, it doesn't sound like they're going to be replacing standings but they might be replacing the mechanism by which you gain and lose standings, right? Because, like, faction standings right now is, like, the hardest fucking thing to get. But if I could swear for the... If I could swear allegiance to the Galente, and now my actions give me Galente faction standings, I think that that... That seems to me, like, closer to be what they're going for. Right. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, they, they just... There's not really sort of a lot of details, so... Um, so I think there's there's just a lot of speculation. And like part of the challenge for like I feel like as a CSM candidate running is they sort of just gave us a high level of faction warfare. You know, there's right. gonna be these frontline systems, which all of that sounds great, but like it's getting down to the nitty gritty details and and like you pointed out, you know, with the Sinojams, like CCP is gonna actively target non faction warfare citadels or citadels from the opposing faction anchored in the space like that's gonna affect people beyond faction warfare right yeah yeah yeah, totally and it's also true that they said that like new things will be birthed through faction warfare the example that i like to give is like um they showed off the new smaller structures the the kind of the quick deployable structures or whatever and they showed different racially versions of it so let's say the empires go to war Suddenly they need, you know, better technology to quick deploy. They ask Upwell for this. Upwell develops this new line, depending on which team is winning gets it first. But those structures, now that they are in the game, becomes the tool that wormholders use and becomes Nullsec, you know, what that Nullsec uses, etc. Um, do, do you agree with that assessment? And do you think that's a good thing? Yeah, I think that if there is something that can be of a benefit to a specific space like i i think so eve is a sandbox you know if we introduce a structure or we introduce a mechanic we need to understand how that structure or how that mechanic is going to affect space beyond the place in which it was originally released um right so i'm curious more details about this new structure um what's it gonna do how is it gonna work how is it going to affect the space beyond uh, maybe the space it was originally intended for. Right. And that's my point is, is that while it might be created through the context of the Empire's Infaction War, it might be being created for Nullsec, right? Like its intended space for the actual mechanic may be different than where it gets introduced into the game. For instance, um, the compression mechanic doesn't have anything to do with running angel sites even though the compression mechanic was brought into the universe by the angel cartel stealing it from, uh, from or sorry. Right. Yeah. It was angel cartel. Yeah. Zohar. That was the, the, like the hunt with capital changes. Right. So in that sense, like though the capital changes wasn't for events, but that event brought forth the capital changes. Correct. So that brings me to the other question. What do you say to people that think that this is a horrible idea, that it is a sandbox, and that telling these stories through NPC actors by, quote-unquote, scripted stories, that's a bad thing, that CCP should be not moving towards that? Um, so, so my initial reaction to the ARCs was a sense of frustration um, because we, we did this with the Treglavians. And so there was three acts, and only in the third act did we find out that these systems that the Treglavians won were going to be removed from normal space. Technically, so we, we didn't even know that until the end. We actually didn't know what was going to happen to Pochvin until Pochvin. Right. We and so, so like, like part of the challenge was is once that was revealed, people all of a sudden were very interested in interacting with it. My, my concern is, is that they're going to do the same thing where they announce something and then people go, I don't know why this matters. And then CCP's right at the end is going to be like, here's why it matters. And then people are all of a sudden going to want to interact with it right. where they could have been interacting with it for the past six months if you just told them why it mattered initially. And I feel like that may already be playing out because there's a lot going on and a lot of people aren't aware of it, right? Like even even me, the lore guy, 
you know, once I started digging into this, realized it, like this this plot, this current quote unquote arc, goes back to 2018, and like different things that we had in context, uh, like is is kind of being reframed, uh, and I don't know whether or not it was intentional or they're just like cleverly working it together, but I think that you're absolutely right. And and another good example is uh, actually just in this last event because you could choose between the sides. I can't count the number of people who call, uh, who messaged me asking whether or not this choice was going to matter in this event. Um, however, CCP has said that that was one of the biggest problems with uh, with the invasions that they didn't properly communicate to people like the consequences of the choices, and so that's one of the things that they really want to fix going forward. So, um, I I I I at least hope that that fear is you know not going to be allayed you know right and but ccp also needs to commit to the sandbox like there have been events in the past like the luminaire titan like i was there we shot right. and we protected the titan and then ccp just dropped a bunch of dreads on it and killed it anyway because they wanted it to be railroaded for a specific ending right that titan was always going to die no matter what we did and um you know, to the same extent, people like to say that Pochfin was always going to be formed. I, I disagree that it was 100% scripted. You know, obviously, our successes and failures are what decided what systems got token. Um, and theoretically speaking, I, I still stand by the fact that, like, had we have all just been like the um, Serenity server, we could have fortified every single system. I also agree that that would be impractical to expect given our population. Um, and so it was it was very much a kind of an assumed foregone conclusion, as it were. I can agree with that. That being said, I also feel like this is why CCP has signposted that idea that there can be consequences. I feel like CCP has been nervous at the idea of letting uh, uh, our choices actually have like a, a an actual like impact on the story in that way, perhaps because of the exact reason why you were just describing. Right. Like if if. If there's a permanent change, like now everybody who didn't fight over Niarja might be mad that they weren't given an op, like they didn't realize that that was the time to do it and that Niarja is just always going to be gone now, you know? So, um, but CCP did, like during the compression event, they said that the scientists, if the scientists didn't get back, what, what if that delayed the release of the compression technology? So they kind of talked about how our interaction with the events might impact it. And then, on stage, they straight up said it's going to. So I think that that is the direction that they're going. However, there's a lot of concern with that too, right? Like once you start doing that, then it's like, that's a whole different can of worms to open. Um, one, of the, one of the questions that got asked in chat is, wasn't the unknown nature of the invasions part of what was cool about it? And that's the other piece to this too. How much information does CCP give us ahead of time as to the consequences of our choices and how much of it should just be, I, I, I don't know. I have to make a choice based on my feelings about the matter, not knowing whether or not it is the right choice. Right. And, and, and it's a challenge and it's, it's an execution thing. I know lots of people like Eve for the unknown, but if you don't tell me why it matters to me, I don't care and I'm not going to interact with it. Which yeah. is what I did with the Triglavian thing till we found out, oh, hey, this matters, you know? Right. And I think that the part of the problem is that it's not enough to simply just tell it, right? You know, uh, CSP Homar signposted a year before that that they were going to start taking away stars potentially. People said that he was lying or he was just, you know, being Helmar. Um, when even when in chapter three started to begin and we were talking about the different systems, a lot of people ignored it. It wasn't until Nararavos flipped. That was it. That was the moment. That's what caught everyone's attention. Everybody's like, oh, shit, I get it now. High sex systems can become null sec. And so there's a certain amount of that like signpost demonstration that's required, which I think that's why I said that what I would have preferred with the with the fan fest would have been like rather than saying there's an arc out there, it's already going. They should have been like. This is the climax of the arc. These are the things that have happened for the last six months as part of this arc. These are the things that you've missed. These are the ways that people could have affected it or did affect it. The, you know, this is the consequences. Okay, now that we all understand what this is, the next arc has already begun, right? I feel like 
They've explained to us, or they've at least told us that this thing exists. However, there's a long history of, of quite the opposite of what they've described, and they failed to demonstrate this. So, do, first of all, do you agree with that? And second of all, how do we fix that? Um, I think it's just going to be the CSM working with CCP, getting them the right feedback, because, um, you know, all these different groups are going to have different, are going to feel the effects differently of the changes. Um, their pilots are going to feel, you know, hey, this story was really well executed, or this aspect was really well executed. Just being able to get that information to CCP um, so they can make the next one better. Because I think CCP is going to stick with this, um, and we just need to help them improve it and keep it interesting and worthwhile. So all that said, and based on what CCP has said about the faction warfare rebalance, what do you think should be their highest priority of all of the different aspects? Because like, you know, some things get cut in the cutting room floor. You know, sometimes something's got to give. What is the like one or a few of like the tippy top things where it's like you need to make this happen. Everything else comes second. So I think CCP absolutely needs to get the rewards correct. Mm. I know that they've, you know, they have the tier system and then it just incentivizes farmers and then there's faction warfare missions that pay out too much. And I know they've been nerfed recently, um, but just making sure that the majority of the reward goes to those who are fighting and are losing ships and are actually engaging instead of, you know, giving it to farmers or giving it to mission runners like it should be the place for pvp so uh i agree one of the things that has always been the issue and i've always said uh, i've said this for a long time mechanically faction warfare is great the act of fi fighting over plexes and the way that system control fights play out is actually really exciting to this day it's the context that sucks right um, and one of the biggest things is that the rewards are backwards. The more you're winning, the more money you make. And therefore, it encourages snowballing and, uh, and then eventually, you know, bots swinging the war zone as it's like, okay, well, we farm a bunch and now we want the other side. So that way this LP becomes more valuable. So we're just going to flip the war zone. And so it kind of makes it gamey. Um, do you agree that the, that the rewards are backwards or how else could we fix that? So I feel like the more you're winning, the it's it's kind of weird because like the more winning you do, the more LP enters the system, which devalues the LP more. Right. Um, so it's it's this tug of war. If we're winning, our LP is worthless. Our LP value crashes. Then the other side's winning. Our LP value skyrockets. Like I think it needs to be smoothed out. Um, and I think that moving more towards a frontline system, so condensing the PvP or a majority of the PVP in just a few systems is going to really help prevent those wild swings that we're experiencing now. So there's a lot of people in Faction Warfare that are in Faction Warfare because they're role players, right? Like people join Null Blocks in order to be part of a big player thing. People join high sec, are in high sec in order to, you know, either do stuff on their own or, you know, be in a safer area or whatever. But like explicitly people that join Faction Warfare are doing so because they want to advance the, the, the agenda of their empire, right? Or not everybody, but like, you know, there, if you want to join, if you want to work for an empire, that's the way to do it. I'll put it that way. Um, so to that end, I remember one of the things that struck me during the last faction warfare, uh, round table that I uh, was part of, not the one at FanFest, but years ago was that the faction warfare players actually wanted lowered rewards in faction warfare that the fact that Faction Warfare was so good for ISK made it so that it was just about farming it, and that they would much rather rewards that were non, uh, didn't have a set value, titles, medals, you know, uniforms, you know, stuff like that. Um, things that make them feel like they're accomplished without necessarily making it so that people join explicitly to make money. Um, do you, how do you feel about that and how do you feel about the relationship between role players and faction warfare? Is that important? And are you going to be able to advocate for them? Yeah, I, I love that 
people get into the role play aspects of it like this is me i am fighting for this empire we're going to fight them here's why like and you can do all this all the fun things like making fun of amar because they're very religious or you know making fun of mimic park as their tribal or you know making fun of kaldari because they're um they're all super capitalist um so so like you can get into the lore you can you know have a reason to fight you can you know smack talk and local a little bit um but i definitely think that the reward should be both because it's it's important that we still allow people to make enough money that they can replace their ships because right. if you can't replace your ships like you're going to go somewhere else um but i th- i would i would love if like the new heraldry system made it visually spectacular if you were part of this really great fight or this really great campaign Mm. or you know you got a new costume or you got new titles or new ranks or you know there's a lot that ccp can do here um to make the rewards that aren't necessarily like hey it's more risk in my wallet but are still meaningful do you think ccp should add an achievement system and should it have rewards so i feel like that's what the heraldry system is supposed to be Um, well the heraldry system is is things that you can buy for inner bus points, which there's, but there was like, they did talk about like the career system. And that did sound like it was going to augment like the, um, the uh, activity tracker and opportunities thing to provide kind of an achievement based thing. But that, that's what makes me ask this question, whatever, whichever one, uh, whatever name you want to put to it. When the activity tracker that first came out, or that is out first came out, players were adamant that there should not be rewards on it because people didn't want to feel like artificially compelled to play, take part in an achievement system. So what we got was a very watered down thing. Um, do you advocate for whatever the, not the system is, do you advocate for the achievement system and should it have rewards? So I think that the achievement system really allows and can kind of give direction to players to explore a lot of aspects that they may not currently um i would be down with some rewards as long as they're not broken and feel like you know i'm behind if i don't do it or or we give the advice to the new players to complete your achievements or you're going to be behind you know i want it to be optional but still meaningful should you complete it right that's fair um and i i guess i see what you're saying like harold's the heraldry system can be used for rewards as well. Yeah. So like if you're part of a campaign that, you know, achieves its goal of, you know, striking deep into enemy territory and taking a specific system, like there should be a cool heraldry for that. Or if you take all of the faction warfare space, there should be a cool heraldry thing for that too. So anytime you're flying, people can be like, oh, he was a part of that. Or they were, you know, at this event that was right. really important. Yeah. Um, I've also always talked about like having a website that allows you to have profiles and, and like use your Z kill to pull and be like, if you're in BTEC R, you know, I can detect that you're in BTEC R and give you a little BTEC R medal. Um, and I think that people would really, really like that. You know, we talk about how Eve is about building up your history and yet we really don't have very many good systems to establish history besides corp history, which is bogus and Z kill, which is problematic for its own reasons. Um, so yeah, I, I think that there has been resistance to it in the past, but I feel like that's changed. Um, yeah, I would, I would, I would agree. I think players want to have a reason to be in space and to be rewarded for doing that. Right. Uh, I had another question, but now I just lost it. So let's move on, um, to filaments. We can, might be able to come back to that other stuff, but I do want to touch on this. You are saying that there needs to be a 30-second spool of time for filaments. Now, when we last uh, addressed filaments last year, uh, the majority of what I heard was that this was a problem in wormhole space, that between roach fleets and eviction victims, uh, the use of filaments were just too strong, and that's why we needed to get rid of it. The 30-second spool of timer would allow people to, you know, activate a combat timer, which would force the filament to fail and let them kill them, you know, whatever... That got fixed. Filaments can no longer be used in wormholes. And yet, here we are. You didn't, you didn't run last year. You didn't accidentally copy and paste last year's point. So why, does filament still, why do filaments still need the 30-second spool-up timer? So 
when I was in Mass Trump and Calvary, uh, we were getting evicted right when CCP initially launched the filaments for the very first time. And we were just sitting there and we're like, you know, there's these filament things. And someone's like, I'm willing to bet you we could like get a DST full of stuff and send it out and just filament it out of the wormhole to deny loot. Yep. And we got close to like a trillion isk out of our wormhole doing that. So yep. it was very, very, very broken. Um, Let me break in real quick. Roach fleets is a specific term in which people use like either their static or another connection to go into a different wormhole system than where they live or, you know, whatever, and then run the sites there real quick and then leave. Go on. Right. And, and what makes roach fleets really powerful is that if you were to try and kill the roach fleet, because all of wormhole rats will point a single target they were making enough money that they could just sacrifice that ship warp off bounce safes wait out their timers and then fill them in so the rest of the fleet got away for free and they could just replace that ship um, so it was really low risk for them um, so i would say that the 30 seconds wolf timer is is comparable to safe logging in space. Like CCP has decided that no matter what ship you're in, if you want to log out in space safely, you need to sit there with no modules running for 30 seconds. You know, that's what you need to do. And then the game will remove you safely and no one can attack you at that point. So if CCP has already decided that is the threshold for safety, then filament should follow the same rule. So if, if you're bouncing around safes and you're like, okay, we've worked out all of our timers, let's filament out. I want you stuck in space for 30 seconds so someone has an opportunity to probe you down and engage you just like they could with a super logging off in space. It should be the same rules for everyone. And if you're not safe enough to do that, then you shouldn't get a get out of jail free card to avoid PVP. So first of all, I kind of want to push back a little bit on that idea. I, I didn't interpret it as like, this is the standard of safety. I, inter I thought it was like, that's the time that it takes from the moment that it detects that you're DC to the when it pulls you out of space. So, no. so when you right click on your capacitor and you hit safe log, it says, OK, you need to sit here without your modules right. on for 30 seconds. Yeah. So what they did was they made it so that you can actually... Like before, you'd have to close your client, and then you'd be there for 30 seconds left. Now you can just sit there and wait out the 30 seconds just, so, just in case something goes wrong. Well, Not so that it was their standard of safety. close your client, it will warp you a million kilometers away, and you will sit there at that spot as long as you have timers. So right oh. when they announce that well, change... Yeah. Uh, you can't safe log with timers either, right? That is correct. Right. So yeah. So I think we're talking about the same thing, but um, either way, that's that's almost moot. There is actually a really good point that was brought up in chat, though, which is, you know, you keep focusing on using it as a get out of jail free card. But what about people with war decks? Right. There's a lot of people that operate in Jita that may or may not have war decks. A 30 second timer will make it so that they can't use filaments to get into jail free. I, I'm I don't I guess I don't understand the use case there. Like they're going from like high sec to null sec to PvP there. Correct. I'm in null I'm in high sec. I'm in Jita. I'm gonna I want to use a filament to go do my roaming fleet or whatever, right? But I've got some people in my fleet that are in a war deck. So normally I would just warp to the safe, instantly filament out, and we're good. But now if it takes 30 seconds, the chances of a war decker coming and messing up that attempt before I can even get to null sec. Uh, increases by quite a bit good like you are using a filament to avoid the war deck pvp like you shouldn't get a get out of jail free card to avoid that pvp uh well they're trying to go to pvp i mean but there's pvp already there like that's the problem is like well, i will chase but... a gang across null sec they'll bottle up in a system bounce safes and i'm like you guys can just fight us and I'm like no we're not going to fight you and then they'll fill them in a way to try and find pvp somewhere else like it's a get out of jail free card for the pvp that's trying to happen well hear me out so like art gravy just had a birthday party right and so like they go out on roams so it isn't that like a person wants to use a filament and they want to get away from things but like what if there's an MPSI fleet getting ready to go, and now while you could work around it and be able to go even if you have a war deck, now just having a war deck suppresses my ability to do that full stop. 
this isn't a matter of somebody chasing me down because like that's just now a constant threat because there's always going to be war decks or you know war war targets in Jita or whatever. Right. So you need to find a way to be able to do that where you can spend the 30 seconds safely and filament away. So you feel like that's a fair like you would advocate for that rather than say, well, maybe the spool of timer is different depending on which area of space you are. Zero seconds for high sec, 10 seconds for low sec, 30 seconds for uh, for null sec. I think it should be the same across all spaces. Like you shouldn't have an advantage to escape PVP just because you're in high sec. All right. That's fair. I appreciate you doubling down. Uh, this actually, um, earlier you were saying that there's a lot of unknowns. One of the reasons why you explore, explore, explore these topics um, at this point is because, yeah, we don't know exactly what you as a CSM person are going to have to give feedback about or give you know input for. So the only thing that we can do is kind of discuss things uh, as hypotheticals to kind of see how you work through problems. So that's the whole thing. And I really appreciate you, you know, uh, working on like taking in the input, but also, you know, staying firm to the things that you think are important like that's no i appreciate it i hadn't actually even thought about the war deck angle before like that's why it's so important to get out there and have people ask you questions because they come up with situations i don't consider usually absolutely all right uh okay new default overview for new players so the new default o the overview thing has two problems one the default that's given is lackluster to the point where literally CCP has started to just recommend the ZTAC S or whatever overview uh, openly. And yet uh, the other problem is, is that when CCP adds new en entities, those entities don't get added to the overview by default. The first one could theoretically be changed pretty easily by CCP just changing the defaults. The second one is far more difficult just because of the way that the overview gets gets stored, like your overview options get stored. It's a it's a whitelist kind of thing. So if it's if you don't have it on your overview, there's no way for them to know that it's new versus old because it's just not in your list. Uh, that being said, they are they've talked about redoing the overview. So let's talk a little bit about what CCP needs to do in this overview revamp to make it better. So like the overview is one of the most, probably even the most important thing on your screen when you're out flying a spaceship. Um, so, so you know, if, if CCP says, hey, that ZS overview pack that we recommend, we're just gonna make that the standard, I think that's a great first step. Um, I can understand the not wanting to add new things to people's already existing overviews because I have mine set up in a very specific way. And if you start including things that I'm not expecting on there, right. then you may have just lost me like a PVP fight. Um, so, you know, I would get very frustrated because, hey, that's not on there. I didn't choose to have that on there. You mandated it for me. Um, I think that perhaps there should be a better way to... Um, to build overviews like maybe there should be some sort of like json format or something so we can edit it out of game and be able to import it well you technically um, can't yeah you can okay yeah. i didn't know that yeah that's what i'm saying like it's saved literally it's saved as like a plain text of a list of all of the things that are on your overview the entities that's why i said like it's whitelisted so you know if you have uh irregular cruisers on your over thing it'll have it there but if they add irregular titans well your list still doesn't have irregular titans and it doesn't know if you don't have it because you chose not to have it or because it just got added you see what i'm saying right um it would be interesting if they could if there was like some sort of third party tool or if ccp could give you like a simulated overview um that would so you could like see what the change is and automatically adjust your overviews if you want to include it or like say you know these 17 of my 54 overview profiles i want that entity added what i think that you could do is you could put like a versioning on the overview like behind the scenes so that way you know when it boots up it checks your overviews versioning versus your saved in overview information and then if that doesn't match then it checks for then you know 
uh, they would have to like put up the upgrade path, but it says like, hey, these are the entities that have been added. Do you wish to have them added to your overview as like a pop-up when you first log in? And then it just increments the um, internal or your, your, your version of the um, version number. Do you think that that would be a good idea? Yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely an option. I mean, it would have to come down to what CCP can actually implement because mm -hmm. um, the, the end game, it's difficult to look at a list of items and go, well, what's in this category? You know, how, what's the order it's going to appear in? Um, just trying to get it right versus um, just guessing as to what you think it's going to be. So let's get dramatic for a second, because one of the things that they talked about is having multiple overviews, which I think is by far like that made me happier almost than the faction warfare announcements, which was surprising even to me. But um, like with that in mind, like we are not constrained to the way the overviews are now. What needs to happen that makes them to, to make them good? One of the things that I before you answer that, I just want to stress that one of the problems that I've been seeing with new players is not only do they not understand the overview, but just the amount of resistance to using the overview I see. Like they, they actively, they want to find any other way to find the thing in space or, you know, wherever, like they don't want to deal with the overview. So how do we make the overview better? Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm really torn on this idea that I've been thinking about is like almost having like an MPE for like the UI and the overview, which, you know, if it gets more complex with like the Photon UI where you can have multiple different things, you know, you could have four or five different overviews on there at once, like you're going to have to be able to guide new players through that. Um, and, and maybe one of their new MP things should be focused on it. Right. I, I do like that idea, um, or at least even if not in the MPE, there certainly needs to be stuff in that help section where they have videos or the agency. You know, they talk about how to run missions, but not talk about how to understand your overview, which is kind of bizarre. Um, okay, so cool. New fleet PVE sites for SOV. Yeah, so so I'll just I'll just start out. So one of the things that I have been adamant with for a very very long time is that Nullsec makes poverty isk. Like your average line member running sanctums or whatever, and like Ishtars is making like sixty million isk an hour, and that was before all of the DBS nerfs and all of the you know Sino nerfs and all these other things that allowed you to do that fairly safely. Right. Um, and my criticism to all of the Nullsecers was, well, if you're getting attacked, why don't you just fleet up? And they said, well, the issue is, is that the more people I put into a site, the lower ISK per hour each person gets. Correct. Where is the opposite of wormhole space, where if I'm running a C5 site, the faster we kill things, the more each person makes. Um, so I would much rather see a new fleet pve option um that's constant like um litharex just said nullsec incursions exist but that only spawns very rarely in a specific space like you should have an option as an alternate to a sanctum or a haven or any other anomaly to put 10 or 12 people into a site have it be difficult enough that you have to bring logi and so each person has an incentive to group up and fleet up so they make more risk per person and they get the defensiveness of being in a fleet. Like, I love running around and tackling things in my malediction. And if I'm landing on a grid with 12 people and trying to tackle something, I'm going to be in for a rough time. So it gives them that natural defensiveness, and they have an incentive through higher ISK to actually group up. Uh, yeah. Um, I, th I would say that nullsec incursions are the, are the exception that proves the rule, right? Like, if anything... Uh, null second incursions shows that we need more of that kind of content that you know we we continue to cling on to like a life raft you know 12 year old raid systems it's like hey guys you can totally run molten core in, in null sec too it's like well okay great thanks uh you know meanwhile uh a really good point uh to this is in invasions there was a minimum or sorry, a maximum payout such that if you brought 
two people into a site, you got the same payout as if you got you did it by yourself. Uh, up to three people for the for the tier one site. So if th- you know if, if one person gets in, he gets eight point five million. If three people come in, all three of them get eight point five million. Um, I I would like to push back a little bit about the fact that null sec routers like don't get faster ISK. They actually would get faster ISK in the same exact way that um, wormholers do. If they're clearing the sites faster, they're making more money. But it is true that um, it it you are now splitting the money. I think that it would be nice if there were site payouts that encouraged you to bring more people. Because if you don't, you're leaving money on the table. I think that that was one of the greatest things about uh, invasion content. Yeah, I mean, there's there's all sorts of like game design things that could go into a fleet PVE site. Um, but I also think it's important that we still have the solo sites because there's someone that's going to log in and say, hey, I only have half an hour. I just want to go run a quick site and then I'm gone. They don't have the time to form up and fleet up. Right. Um, but just to give that option also. Yeah, and CCP did suggest that they're bringing out new sites, um, and they talked a little bit about what that would entail, but then it completely vanished off the radar. You know, they said they had to deprioritize it for structures, and then suddenly it's not even mentioned it in in uh, FanFest, which I found uh, remarkable. <laughs> uh, I I do feel like nullsec ratting needed to be brought down because it was just bad content from a game design point of view but like part of that implies the fact that you put in the better content and now there's just like a content sized hole in nullsec right i think there's a lot of frustration with abyssals and like trying to remove those because it removes people from the the game while they're running the abyssal sites and my thing is is if you remove abyssals then like that's some of the best PVE in the game. Like we're doing the same sanctums and havens that were in the game when I started. Like CCP should have updated this stuff like a decade ago, and we're still running the same sites. Yeah, people don't appreciate exactly how many people are in space because of Abyss. Maybe not while they're running the Abyss, but you know these people move on to go out and fly around and fight. Um, but yeah, so. One of the things is is that like events have been a really big way that they've experimenting with new different kinds of sites and new kinds of AI, uh, and especially that like fleet combat PvPVE kind of conflict. Um, however, for the most part, CCP has focused on low security space for uh, for that kind of stuff for the better for the better sites, um, and only rarely like maybe delve or Declan will have something interesting going on, depending on which is the hosting empire. And I fear that part of the problem, this has led to that idea of like, all events are cookie cutters or whatever, because like the slice of events that 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 um, Nullsec sees is minimal as far as like it, it, the interest of it. Um, so I guess, is the issue that we do need more interesting and variety PVE uh, uh, events. Do we need to somehow help the people that aren't into events understand how fun events can be? Uh, or do we run into that problem of um, the other side of the coin of like people getting mad at non-consensual PVE, right? If an event happened, like the drifter attacks, right? If that was the event, even if it did reward people, like, people didn't seem to like that. So how how do we get people in nullsec to actually be excited about PVE if we're going to be giving them PVE? So 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 there's there's a lot of challenging things and and you talked about some of them. So I think like at its core CCP really wants low sec to be valuable. That's why they're shoving so many sites there. That's why when they did the industry rebalance, they massively buffed the amount of isogen and noxium that was consumed because they want people to be able to live in low sec and make a living in low sec. Well, they want to lure people to low sec, that's for sure. Yes. Um whether they're successful or not, I think still has to be determined. Um, but I think that's why we're seeing a lot more focus on sites, you know, whether it's the keys for the um, ESS reserve banks being there or just any of the new data sites that they've been adding. Sure. Um, I, I think agree. that NullSec will be excited for PVE um, if we just give it to them. Um, you know, 
I, I'm not quite so sold on events. I feel like if, if CCP had just skipped the events and had spent the time reworking missions or reworking the soft sites or reworking wormhole sites, you would get a much larger long-term payout. Um, but we're not doing that. We're instead investing in um, just more events that show up for a couple of weeks and they leave. Well, a lot of the events are repeating now. So like they are... They're not one-off events, and they do build off of each other. I, I, my concern is, like, PvE, by definition, on a long enough timeline, no matter how good it is, will become stale. So I suspect that there's a certain amount of, like, it being shuffled up every, little, uh, every so often um, that is essential. So, like, you know, in February, we're going to be fighting Angels and Serpentis. We're probably going to be in Wormhole Space. In April, we're going to be fighting the Garistus. We're probably going to be in low sec and destroyers and 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 frig uh, assault frigates. Um, in in Halloween, we're going to be fighting blood raiders or or, or Amar. You, you get what I'm saying? Like, I I feel like they're. It's essential to mix it up, but at the same time, everybody keeps saying that missions or sorry events are are cookie cutter. So are they not mixing it up enough? And what more could they do to make them actually like? worth engaging with for for more people or at least seen at so, least perceived as exciting right so so in my experience with doing the events it is exceptionally grindy um so you're spending an excessive amount of time trying to get all of the rewards i mean it is like dozens of hours and i think that if you shorten it to the point at which people can experience it for a couple of hours enjoy it and have fun and then maybe back off from it like you know maybe make it a week here a week there um then people will be excited they'll be like oh i can get in i can get my rewards i can interact but they're not interacting long enough for it to become boring and they're not interacting long enough to be like oh the site again Right. Well, one of the things I really liked about the Doctor Who event was that there was a real sense of progression, right? Like, you couldn't start running the filaments until you could build the filaments, which meant you had to find sites. Then, you know, you had to go into Tier 1 in order to get the stuff to do Tier 2. And then you had to start getting into the combat sites and work your way further and further up. I remember, like, the second day into the event, um, I was going to, or, you know, chilling out after, after the stream and everything... Uh, playing Final Fantasy fourteen, and it suddenly struck me that nobody had gotten a bow tie yet because nobody had, like, there just hadn't been enough time for anybody to have gotten across that finish line. And so uh, that actually caused me to stop everything and get back into it because there's somewhere to go. I feel like a lot of events don't have anywhere to go, that you're just running the sites, and sure, like, you're making progress on the track, but A, the track rewards suck, and B... It's it's just more of the same. Whereas the Doctor Who site really or Doctor Who event really felt like you were making progress through it. But at the same time, what that meant was that when the Doctor Who event was wrapping up, there was a lot of people, myself included, that felt that they weren't done yet. Now I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but what do you think about that kind of um, uh, progression? Right. So so I, I did do the Doctor Who event. I liked the progression because it was like right when the initial sites got boring, boom, I had a new site. Um, my frustration was, was that it didn't give me enough resources to continue playing at that new site level. So right. it was like, grind a little bit, get the new site, want more of it, but I can't. I have to go back to grinding the same old sites I've been doing before. So I think well, if this the goes back to communication consistent, it would be better. Yeah, this goes this also goes back to communication because the way that the drops worked was that you would get a lot of one thing. And and so you'd be missing something. But another person would get a lot of that thing and then they'd be missing a different thing. So like the intent was to trade. And in fact there were tasks to do so. But people still interpreted it as they had to go and grind. I, I don't know how CCP fixes that. Right. So so the problem was, was I was doing these out in NullSec, but I was one of maybe two or three people in my alliance that was trying to do them. So there really wasn't enough critical mass of us to trade so we could all continually progress. Um, 
So, you know, if you really want to be successful, you actually would go to a trade hub in like Amara Jita, but like, guys, I'm at in Tenerifis. Like, I don't have the ability to do that very quickly. Um, so my solution to the buy and sell things was to buy and sell with my alt so I could just get the points and get a new task. Like, I don't think it worked the way CCP wanted. Oh, it absolutely didn't work the way that CCP wanted. That was my, but that's my point is that like, I, I could see the pieces and I could see where people where where CCP intended for it to go, and I also saw that nobody did it. You know what I mean? Like, it didn't right. work it, to get it, people to it actually perform that. Probably would have been more successful if it wasn't the Doctor Who theme. I know a lot of people were turned off because that was something outside of Eve. Right. Um, that's fair. There's already like a um, a bias against it. Uh, I think that, I don't know, that's a, that's a rabbit hole, but we are actually running low on time. So, uh, let's go ahead and I guess lightning around our way through some of the rest of these topics. Okay. Um, so allow super capital to be built in low second NPC null sec. I, this is something I feel pr pretty passionate about. Um, so on the one hand, uh, in order to have any territory in, in low sec, you have to first own solve, which is sort of backwards because people can drop dr Titans on you. Uh, and blow up your structure. Uh, I've often said that I would like to suppress the ability to use supers in uh, low sec. You want to double down on supers on low sec. Talk to me about it. Yeah, so supers are always going to be a contentious issue. Those that have them want to use them. Those that do not have them either don't want to see them or they want to get their own eventually. Um, and depending on which camp you find yourself in will sway your decision on this. Um, I look at it as sort of an interspace balance issue. And the issue is, is in order to successfully take Sov, you need supers. But in order to get supers, you have to sacrifice your independence to take Sov. So like there should be a flow from high sec to low sec slash NPC null sec and into Sov but the question is, how do you get over that supers barrier? Um, and I think it would just make sense that you can build them in low sec and NPC null sec. Um, now, I don't imagine people are always going to take kindly to your attempts to build them. You know, I imagine the null sec soft blocks are going to attack the sodios that you're throwing down to build them. Um, but, you know, I would much rather groups have the option to acquire supers without having to sacrifice their independence. Um, and sure. I get it from a, like, I was a small ganger. I got dropped on by Tinker Hell's Revenant and a bunch of their other supers when I could barely get into a capital and they obliterated me. Um, I get it from, like, hey, they have those toys. I don't want to fight them. I don't want to see them. But, like, it's a sandbox. We can't stop someone from flying a super we can't stop someone from bringing a super to fight you if they really want to do it well you can't bring it to high sex so there are restrictions um i guess my pushback to that is um if i see low sec as being the place for smaller scrappier fights both in like the ships and in like the sizes of fleets like look at faction warfare faction warfare actively resists the idea of like apex level fighting for the most part um, with the way that plexes are. However, so like the only time that a faction warfare pilot would even need to engage with that kind of stuff is in order to have a structure, which of course, you know, some people might want to do. Um, and then also when we look at Potchfin, we can see it like how vibrant of a, of a, a, of a PVP world that has become in a world in which we don't have to worry with capitals and super capitals. Is it really necessary for us to have a so uh, for us to have um, a sandbox for the for supers to be able to press everywhere that PvP happens? So I don't think so. If supers are oppressing PvP everywhere, then we need to adjust supers. Um, I think that you know when when you say like oh well faction warfare is sort of the antithesis because you can't bring supers through the gates into the complexes but you know one of these days someone is going to acquire supers in faction warfare and they're going to drop them on the i hubs they're going to drop yeah, them we drop on dreads the... on the i hubs all the time right so 
you know, there's an opportunity there for someone to interfere with supers. Um, right. So it's already there. Right. But at the same time, like the that that fight, like an iHub remains vulnerable as long as the system is vulnerable. So even if like Snuff shows up with a bunch of, uh, you know, supers, we'll just hold the system as vulnerable and wait till they're no like as soon as they blink, then we take the system. You, know, you get what I'm saying? But, right. And that's fine. That is an opportunity for you to choose not to engage with what Snuff is trying to do. But I can't do that with my structure. So, you, like I said, you, I, do we want to tell low-sec entities that the solution to their problem is to buy, you know, 20, 30 billion-ish ships? Is it, even if, without Sov, is that supposed to be necessary in order to be able to defend yourself? I mean... The if goons or NC dot or in it wanted your structure destroyed, they could drop supers on it today. Um, the reason right. they haven't is they choose not to. Um, but the second you piss them off, they're bringing the whole farm. So, you know, it's always an option. You don't have to engage with supers and titans. You can drop dreads. Dreads were changed so that they could trade positively versus titans. Like there's other options. It's just when we get into null sec and when we get into that server tie dye throw down, everybody show up, the maximum effectiveness per character is a titan. So they're going to have titans and I'm supposed to fight them, but I can't bring in an infinite number of smaller ships to fight them. I'm limited by what the server can do, so I need the maximum effectiveness per person, and that's a Titan. Like, I have to meet their Titans with Titans. What do you say to the null seckers that say that, like, this is just, like, supers being able to be built only under SOV and only under certain levels of strategic index, I think, um, is is part of the, the puzzle, right? Like, if, if we could just build supers in low sec, then that's what they're just going to do rather than in soft. So, you know, I am part of an alliance that would love to independently hold SOV. The issue is, is that we can't fight a super blob. Like that's just the end of the day story. So we have to blew up with a bunch of people. And so I'm currently blue to like five or six regions in EVE. And that just kills content. That kills your ability to roam. Like there's tens of thousands of people I literally can't shoot without consequences coming back to my alliance. Like if we could build ourselves up to the point at which we could independently take Sov, that's something we could work towards. But like this this forced giving up of your independence to participate in SOV and to acquire supers is a huge problem. All right, next, uh, cap boosters. CCP admitted the single cap booster limit is a bug. I don't remember that. I thought that was an actual like balance change. So what they wanted to do was to limit faxes to a single capital cap booster, but effectively allow you to have an unlimited number of um, subcap cap boosters but the issue is is that they coded cap boosters of all sizes into the same item category so sure. they couldn't limit you to one capital cap booster they had to limit you to one cap booster so they just need to go back through and split capital cap boosters off into their own group why is that so worth have, fixing um because and because wormhole heavy armor fights matter to the entire ecosystem of EVE Online, because they consume an incredible amount of high-end ships, of high-end modules, um, and they're just a ton of fun. Like, you want to know why wormhole space is dying? Like, they took out a lot of the options. Um, and CCP admitted it was a bug. Like, they should just go back through and do it right. Um, so they don't run into this issue in the future if they want to balance things further. How are case Bay frig frigate wormholes antithesis to wormhole space? So part of the reason that a lot of groups live in wormhole space is you cannot bring an infinite number of pilots into a system. At a certain point, the mass, the total mass on the wormhole will um, be consumed and the wormhole will collapse. Where frigate wormholes, they have... 
uh, a fairly limited per ship mass, but they have an infinite amount of total mass. So let's say that there's an eviction between hard knocks and laser hawks, um, and the eviction system has a K-space connecting frigate wormhole to 1DQ. Now goons can ping out and then they can get you know several thousand pilots and destroyer and below ships and go interrupt that eviction right um but and because there's no total mass they can go back and forth as much as they like you know it's basically for the next 16 or 24 hours they can do what they want with that system with their numbers so this isn't a matter of people being able to shuttle in and get equipment that's there you're talking about like people being able to bring in like a huge af gang and just mess with things right because a committed wormhole group would be able to find a frigate wormhole through a shattered that then connects to K-space. There'd be like a chain. You just don't want direct connections because that would allow or that encourages outside groups to just kind of raid in. Is that pretty much the assessment? Right. I, I have no problem sense. with wormhole to wormhole frigate connections. I think those are cool. Those are exciting. Um, but, you know, if there's a case of an eviction, then the evicting group can go through the frigate wormhole and then defend that wormhole from incursion. So they have an option, but they don't have that for a case space connecting wormhole. All right. Well, I am uh, I've gone a little bit over my time because you had a lot of things that I wanted to talk about. But is there anything else that you want to uh, big things that I haven't addressed that you want to hit on before we wrap things up? Um, I'm, I'm, there's too much to talk about. I, I really do appreciate the time. If you guys have any more questions, please go on to that EVE Online uh, forum thread and post your questions there, and I will get back to you. I love having these discussions. I love hearing other people's viewpoints. I love adjusting what I believe because someone else has brought something new to me that I didn't consider. Um, nice. And above all, please go out and vote for the CSM. Even if I'm not your number one candidate, or even if I'm not on your ballot, you have a plethora of wonderful candidates to choose from. So please go out, learn about them, and above all, vote. And vote and fill all 10 of your ballot spots. Don't let your vote get thrown away because you didn't fill it out completely. Right. And I do appreciate that. And um, because you're absolutely correct. So we didn't get to go to all of your points. Um, I feel like you have more than a lot of people and uh, good reasoning behind it. I think that um, what I have learned is that you've got some pretty good takes and you are incredibly cogent in your way of discussing them, um, which I, I really appreciate and I really like it. And, you know, you're one of those people that I'm going to say, like, CSM or not CSM you need to not be a stranger on my show, man. We should, we should chat about things more. Like, I feel like oh, yeah, you're, absolutely. you've got some really good I will good come insight. back anytime you want me. Excellent. Okay, great. Well, um, yeah. Uh, is, is there anything, is there any like big highlight? Cause you, there's so like new sob system, re re redo high sec. Is there anything else that you want to like hit on as being like a big point of the things that we haven't hit? Um, I, I, they can spiral into multi-hour conversation, each and every one of them. Well, so I, in, I know you have more after me. In that case, I will just simply say uh, you absolutely should go check out his forum post. Uh, it should be linked. Uh, I just linked it in chat and then it'll be linked in the doobly-doo for those on YouTube uh, because he's got lots of really good ideas and he's obviously very open to thinking or talking about them. Um, if, But I think that that should just about do it for right now. Uh, cause it's one of those things. It's like, yeah, you're right. If we talk about it, we'll talk. It's like, I need to set aside another three hours, which I would love to do, but not right now. So, uh, thank you very much for coming and hanging out. And, uh, it's very nice to meet you. Well, not meet you, but see you, uh, since, you know, we've, we've ran in the same circles a few times, uh, and you have a very respectful history, respectable history, I should say, both you know, as a PVP or and, and, uh, just experiencing Eve online. It's worth noting. So um, I, I think it's pretty safe to say that voting for you is, is a voting for is a vote for uh, level headed consideration of of mechanics and a holistic nature. Uh, would you say that that's fair? Yes, I would completely agree. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming and hanging out. Uh, I wish that I had a, uh, my own TARDIS so that way we could do this for hours. But um, 
It's been very cool talking to you. And thank you all for watching this uh, video, this stream. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe before you go. Uh, you can ask any questions to uh, Alavente uh, in the doobly doo down below. Sorry, in the comments down below, or follow the link in the doobly doo to his forum post where you can post your questions there. Uh, I am pretty darn confident that he will engage with you about it because just based on uh, my, the experience I've had so far. So um, you know, but I really appreciate you guys checking this out either way. If you're watching this on the playlist, just go ahead and hang tight. We're about to head on to the next one. But uh, it's most important that we all find out as much as we can about these candidates and become informed voters because that's how we have an effective CSM. And the CSM is, an, is a great tool for us as players. It's one of the only tools that we get for these kinds of things uh, consistently. And it's only as good as we make it. So uh, we need to work together to make it as good as possible. So once again... Thank you, Alavente, for participating in this and coming here and hanging out with us. Thank you all for watching. And on behalf of Alavente and myself, Ashtarothi, the voice of New Eden, thank you all for watching. And until next time, I'll see you in space.